held the number one ranking for a record 286 weeks and was ranked in the top 10 for 12 years. 14 years, six months, and 15 days is the time it took. Endless hours with a single-minded focus to be one thing and one thing only, the greatest. Owning his craft and his body on courts like this, equipped with a carbonated right arm, pure ice in his veins, and an undying spirit that would belie his battle-tested heart. Fourteen years, six months, and fifteen days is the time it took to win more than any other man. He stands alone. He's arguably the greatest champion of all time. This is the story of Pete Sampras. He's done it. His 14th Grand Slam title. In tennis, the season never ends, and tournaments follow the sun. This never-ending cycle of winning and losing is a mental and physical grind, and very few are able to predict greatness. But for Pete Sampras, the third son to Greek immigrants, this young man's destiny crystallized right from the start. I used to hit against our basement in Potomac, Maryland, hit against the wall. When my mom was doing laundry, I would hit against the garage. As I got a little bit older, just hitting at the park there. After church, I'd go to this club and take a few lessons for the pro there, and, and it was an indoor court, so it was a big deal for me, and it was fun. My dad worked for the government, and he was part owner of a restaurant with his brother-in-laws, and decided to get out of that business and move his to Palos Verdes, and that's when it all kind of started. In moving to Southern California, Sam Sampras immersed Pete into a venerable hotbed of junior tennis. And the Jack Kramer Club would serve as the furnace. The Kramer Club was filled with promising champions. Tracy Austin, Lindsey Davenport, Pete Sampras, they basically all lived within 10 minutes from each other. I started playing against Pete when I was six years old. We started practicing here at the Jack Kramer Club probably twice a week for six, seven years. We moved down to the West End Tennis Club and we went to a tennis academy there together. He was young, he was quiet, he'd hardly say a word. Everybody saw the talent in Pete, but there was a lot of talent around. So nobody thought it was like extraordinary. I mean, if he went to Topeka, Kansas, you know, people would have thought he was the, the greatest thing since sliced bread, but around here it was kind of, okay, there's another good tennis player kid. The one thing that I most remember about Pete was when I was walking out the gate at center court, he looked at me and he said, I'm going to be more famous than you someday. And he was like nine, ten years old, and just one of the other nine or ten-year-olds that was here amongst the many. And I looked at him and I thought, wow, that's kind of a brash, confident statement. You know, I'd won two U.S. Opens at the time, but I remember also thinking, you know, this kid knows where he's going. And there were a lot of kids Pete's age here, and I think that helped him as well, that there were a lot of kids his exact age that were playing junior tournaments, that wanted to be good, and, of course, there was Pete Fisher. I knew Pete Fisher before I knew Pete Sampras. He was a guy that my dad met when I was eight years old at the Jack Kramer Club. He's kind of this mad scientist-looking fella. Pete Fisher was an awful tennis player. His forehand was like... He'd take the racket back, flip it back over a couple times like a pancake, and then flip it over here. And this was, and the serve, the serve, go back here, and then flip, flip, back, it's totally stop. He's a fanatic tennis fan. He, he's been a tennis fan since, uh, you know, Rod Laver and you know, Ken Rosewall. He loves that era, and it's been around the game for years. He just could never play it. He was very smart, and he saw that I had talent, that I had this athletic ability, I had this hand-eye coordination that he's never seen before. Pete would say, you know, outrageous things like, I'm going to make people forget about Rod Laver. You know, as a 14-year-old kid, you're like, you know, I'm just trying to hit the ball over the net more than three times in a row. With the cerebral Fisher serving as the team quarterback, 
Pete's formative years would be spent honing his game under the tutelage of the best teaching pros in Southern California, Larry Easley, Del Little, and Dutch ground stroke guru, Robert Landstorm. Okay, now let's get Pete over here, Smiley Pete. What's your nickname, Smiley? He was just the happiest kid. I never saw uh, Pete, like, complaining, depressed, or whining. He used to play and smile. And when he came to see me, he was a little pipsqueak, you know, a little kid. But he was unbelievable quick. He was so fast, this little, this guy. I would play every day. I'd play after school, um, start playing junior tournaments on the weekends. You know, I started traveling around the country to play some junior events. The junior tennis caravan is a familiar junket. Year in and year out, the tournaments, the tournament directors, and parents all stay the same. Every weekend, there's another event, and rivalries are born. And at a 10 and under tournament in Northridge, California, Pete would meet the kid that would become his greatest rival. I remember his game well as, as an eight-year-old, to be quite honest. He was a year younger, and when you're, when you're nine years old, that's a, that's a big disadvantage <laughs> to be a year younger than somebody. So I was a good head and shoulders taller than him. He ran like a, just like a jackrabbit, I mean, around the court. He moved so easily, two-handed backhand. Uh, couldn't break an egg, but, uh, but man, he just wouldn't miss. A lot of his coaches said he had the potential to be the best player. And so I think after you hear it so much, I think I, I believed it for him, you know? Like I knew he was gonna be this great tennis player because that's what everyone's been saying. I didn't see a lot of Pete in the juniors because even though he's a year younger than me, most of the time he was playing up. He started playing in, in the 16s when he was like 12 years old and he was playing in the 18s by the time he was 13, 14 years old. At the time it was kind of a philosophy that we embraced to really work on my game. Don't be so concerned about winning more than than when he just playing well and, and learning and you learn more from your losses than your wins. Playing up, he didn't feel any pressure because he wasn't expected to win. So everything that he was doing was above and beyond and great. And oh, look, at he beat this kid that's so much bigger and stronger than him. Oh, he lost today, but look how much bigger that kid was than him. So there was never really any kind of pressure on him to perform, but yet he was always getting better. I remember looking at Pete thinking, he's, he's a bit out of his league playing up like this, you know? And, but at the same time, he, he seemed to show such a uh, even keel of, of, of competitiveness uh, combined with this sort of relaxation of enjoying something. Like, almost like he went out there with no expectations because he was so much smaller and he was playing guys so much older. It got me to be pretty tough. You know, I was playing kids that were twice as big as I was and I would be on my own out here. I remember that sort of lonely feeling, like I need a little help here. You know, I'm up against this big kid and I get no support from my dad and my sister's playing on the other court and I'm like kind of fending for myself. A lot of us who were in the, in the trenches and the juniors um, wondered would Pete be able to translate this talent into competitive toughness because he'd never faced pressure?